First of all, I have a question for y'all. Uh, raise your hand if you hated group work as a child growing up in school. Like you hated group work, you were always left with the bag, right? You hated group work. I hated group work. I hated in undergrad, I hated in grad school. But today I'm gonna be talking with you very briefly, not about group work, but what I consider the antithesis of group work, collaboration. Because what I feel collaboration is, is the ability to pick your partners that you know are gonna get the work done and actually accomplish something really great. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. We're gonna to talk about two cases very briefly, of course, because I have about 20 minutes to talk with you. Um, one in biological sciences and one in digital history. And I'm going to wrap it up talking about some suggestions um, and lessons learned that I hope will help all of you go back. And if you're librarians and archivists in the room, um, try collaboration with disciplinary faculty. And for the disciplinary faculty in the room, see librarians and archivists as true collaborative partners in this venture. So. I should probably give a little context about who I am um, so you know where I'm coming from for this talk. So my name is Diana Wakamoto. I am one of um, the library faculty members at California State University East Bay. If you don't know where Hayward is, if you've ever visited San Francisco and you looked across the Bay East, that's where we are. Um, so if it's foggy and horrible in San Francisco when you come to visit us, just hop on BART and we'll be nice and sunny and we'll be happy to see you. Um, so I was hired as a science librarian at um, Cal State East Bay, uh, and I liaison to biological sciences, but I also have a background in archives, so I took over management of the university archives as well, on top of all of that. Um, so that's why I'm here talking to you today about both librarians and archivists working with disciplinary faculty. So my first case, I'm going to talk about um, some collaborations that uh, have been ongoing for two years with biological sciences. So a librarian walks into a biology class, sounds like a horrible start to a really bad joke. And I'm horrible about telling jokes, so I'm not going to tell a joke. But this is basically what happened. Um, raise your hand if uh, you've heard your administration talking about the need uh, to increase retention of students and improve graduation rates at your university. OK, right, that's kind of a universal thing nowadays. Um, Cal State East Bay is part of a 23 campus um, system, the Cal State uh, university system. We're one of the biggest public university systems in the nation and our chancellor is super big about increasing retention rates and graduation rates. We have some crazy targets we're supposed to hit. But luckily he has uh, also offered these course redesigns for our bottleneck courses. So those are the courses that have a really high drop, withdrawal, or failure rate. One of which happens to be our intro biology course, which is really bad if you're trying to retain students to become biology majors. And so this is animal sciences. We're actually on the quarter system, so we have a 10-week term and then finals week. So it's really, really fast to cover all the major phyla of the animal kingdom um, with a lab and understand the morphology and physiology and all this great stuff. So um, a group of us, two library faculty, two members of the biological sciences faculty, and an English faculty member decided to come together, put together a grant to redesign this course. And so that's what we did. Now that might seem like kind of a weird combination of people to come together and do this. So why did we decide to collaborate in this way? And how was I brought in? So. Um, the two library faculty members, myself and my colleague Aline Sewells, um, brought the technological expertise to here. Um, at our university, we have a required two credit information literacy course that all freshmen are required to take. So we teach that all the time. And the librarians are actually one of the first departments to do online and hybrid teaching. So we're really up to date on how to use tools to create interactive tutorials, how to mine those open access resources on the web to create a support structure for our students. So that's what we brought to the table. Our biology faculty obviously brought the content knowledge, right? Um, they know what trips up the students. They know all the terms. They know what they need to cover in this course to build that foundation for the next level of courses. So they brought that to the table, but they didn't have time to say learn Captivate and Camtasia and to look through digital archives to find resources that are going to help them and the lesson plans and that support structure. And our English faculty member happens to teach in our English as a Second Language program and also happens to be an expert on doing note taking, study strategies, which our students really need. A lot of our students come first generation to college, a lot of international students, and we have one of the most diverse campuses um, in the contiguous United States. So with all of this, we thought we could redesign this course 
introduce active learning, introduce the support structure, and it's ongoing right now. So um, as we heard from our keynote, what kind of data can we show to see if it's effective? Hopefully we'll have that by the end of this term, and you'll see a paper coming out sometime soon if you want to do that at your university. But what I just want to share really quickly, because they did tell me I would have internet access here. Yes? Let's see if that worked. Oh, it works. Um, so for the librarians in the room and for anyone who's gone to a library site that uses um, live guides, this will look very familiar to you. What we wanted to create was a portal for our students in 1403 to come and find all of those digital resources for them. So going over very quickly, a lot of our students were having trouble with their lab practicals. And it's really hard to pass a lab class if you can't pass the lab practical exam. So we actually created interactive tutorials that would have similar questions to what they would see on their lab practical that actually loops them back around to try the question again if they don't get it right the first time and tell them, no, that term actually means this. Or you're actually looking at the liver here, not the kidney, um, to help the students because it's a lot to take in, um, especially when you're a first quarter freshman at college. Um, we also found that students were whispering in class a lot, not because they were updating their Facebook, but because they didn't know how to pronounce certain terms in the biology class, and no one wants to look stupid in front of their peers by mispronouncing something. So we actually created um, chapter guides for each part of the lab manual that have links out so they can listen to how the word is supposed to be pronounced so when they go into lab or lecture they can feel confident in asking those questions and um, as you know from live guides you can actually see how many times people click links and stuff so that's actually been a very popular thing for us we obviously have a lot of other things, our note-taking strategies, understanding a scientific article, because no one's born knowing that, even if a lot of our professors think the students should be, um, and other resources to support them with peer tutoring and other things like that. And our feedback, because we rolled this out in stages, so we rolled out some of this last year, is that the students really appreciate the extra support, the ability to go back and re use the tutorials um, to help them emphasize in and get into their heads the really key aspects that they need to know from this course to then move on in biology. Hopefully we'll also see what the chancellor would like to see more students passing this course so it is no longer a bottleneck, but we'll see after this term. So that was one of my doo -doo -doo. One example. My second example comes from history. Uh, so as many of you are probably aware of, digital history is a very big new aspect in um, historical studies, right? Uh, we heard about digital humanities earlier today. Uh, digital history often fits into that. And at our campus, we have a very big public history program. Our chair of the history department really wanted to increase what we were doing in digital history because she wanted her students to be able to go out and not only think like a historian, but also have those technological skills to bring to the organization they were at. So for example, if you're at a small community organization, like say a small historical society as a public historian, you will not have usually a wonderful technology setup like we have here today to help you with all of those problems. You're gonna have to bootstrap it. So we wanted our students to be able to bootstrap. So she came to me and because we had worked together before, you know, his historians um, and history department are great friends to the archives and special collections, she's like, is there a way that we could create a new digital history course? Because I want to get this ramped up this year and going forward because they're thinking about redoing their curriculum. I said, I would love to do that. Um, she had heard about some of our digitization grants we had gotten in the archives before. She knew I was really interested in fusing technology and the library and the archives with the history. Um, my PhD is on a history topic, so she knew I wouldn't lead them astray, you know, and herd them all into library science, um, though some of them were interested. Uh, so we created this course. It got passed, thankfully, and last spring we actually taught this course to upper division undergraduates and graduate students, and it was a blast. It was terrible. Terrifying, um, and it was fun at the same time. They were pushed to read outside of history because digital history touches, excuse me, on computer science, library science, archives, all of this great stuff, big data, visualization, all these things they had never thought about before. And they also, because we're talking about collaboration, had to work in teams because most digital history projects are not, you know, the scholars sitting in the archives by themselves. It's a lot of collaborative work, so you can get all those expertise factors that you need to create your project. So our students also had to collaborate. Uh, thankfully, they um, from the evals, they did not find it to be group work, but actually a good team building exercise. And I just wanted to share two examples. 
So one group decided to create, um, this will probably look familiar to some in the room, an Omeka site uh, called Teaching Women's History. If we don't go there, we don't go there, that's okay. Um, and what they found was that although there, was a lot, there were a lot of resources um, about women's history online, um, there wasn't a site, that, co that a portal for that, that also provided lesson plans for K through 12 teachers. One of our um, students used to be a K through 12 teacher. She said, I, nobody has time to look through all those digital archives to figure out a lesson plan, to figure out what standards it actually aligns to. And so wouldn't this be great and a value added thing for historians to do? And they created a really nice site and through this also found out their friend and foe copyright and what they could and couldn't do, getting permissions, which was something they had never thought about before. So it was a great learning experience. One of our others, uh, groups was really interested in the California Spanish missions. It's a big part of our history in California. And they wanted to find a way to provide information to uh, middle school students. So how would you engage middle school students? Well, you need to make something simple. So they used a Weebly site in a blog format. So you just scroll through, but they were able to embed a lot of videos, slideshows, other referenced, because I made them cite everything, uh, resources that they could use and really interact with middle schoolers. So how do we interact online as historians, how do we join this conversation that's happening? So it was another really powerful um, collaboration. And I'm happy to say that we hired um, a history professor who's one of his specialties is digital history. So it is going to be sustained in our university and I'm hoping to do more projects with them. So what does it all mean, right? Um, I'm a huge XKCD fan if you don't read the comic. I suggest you start. Um, so I have um, six lessons and suggestions from these whirlwind case studies, and I'm happy to talk with anybody more after the session um, if you have questions or suggestions. So one that really was driven home to me uh, collaborating with the history department is that allied fields really don't communicate. We need more communication. Archives, library science, computer science, history all intersect so beautifully in digital history and digital humanities, but we really aren't reading each other's research. I see the same thing being done in all the different disciplines, you know, with a six month offset. And just think of all the great things we could do if we were actually collaborating and talking. And we're all busy, but I think we need to figure out ways on our campuses and then in general, how can we have more communication? How can we speak each other's languages? So for those at the panel before, you know, we all have different jargon and we speak about research and our professions and digitization in so many different ways. How can we come together to really make great collaborations and use those limited budgets that a lot of us are dealing with? I know I'm dealing with that. Um, I think for the disciplinary faculty in the room is seeing librarians and archivists as having the ability to be true collaborators, that we, we can do more than your literature review or help you figure out if we have this title for your class, that we actually have something to bring to the table. We have this information literacy background. We have our own special expertises that can really help you depending on what the project is. And for the librarians and archivists in the room to see yourself as having that expertise, even if you don't think you do, to actually be true collaborators, because you do. We all know our professions historically have some inferiority complexes, um, whether you do or not on a personal level, but you know, stand up there and say, yes, I can help you with this. Yes, we can do this. Yes, I've actually read that paper and here's another paper that you might want to do on these digital collaborations because we have something to bring to the table. I think because I come from it as a very instruction standpoint, um, because my two cases were in different classes, is seeing instruction as an experiment. I know when we stand up here uh, talking, like I'm doing right now at a conference or in the classroom, we really want to think that we have it all together and we've got all the bases covered. But when you're in digital history, in digital scholarship, things happen and we have to see it as an experiment together, right? Involving our students, um, as our keynote speaker said this morning, to be able to show that yeah, the link went down. Oh, now it's behind a paywall. What are we going to do? Because they're going to run into this when they're out in the real world. Um, so you're at the local historical society. You wanted to use this open access um, exhibit maker, uh, but the software is gone now or the company went belly up. What do we do? Well, we can use that as in a safe space in the classroom to model what we're going to do in the real world. Um, finally, a very uh, Practical note, um, get your IRB, so your Institutional Review Board, before you do anything, because 
for those on the tenure track, you always want to get that publication out of it or be able to come and speak about it. So do that to share because that's another way that we can collaborate on a professional scale, a disciplinary scale, is sharing what we have learned. Um, Obviously, communication is key. We're here at a conference today to communicate, to find those um, places that there might be a synergy for collaboration. Um, between our students, it's key. Among our faculty, it's key. Across disciplines, it's key. Um, obviously, I love communication, so I, I really challenge you to go back and see who might be that expert on your campus that you might want to collaborate with that you haven't yet met. And ask them to coffee or tea. Everybody likes that. Um, and finally, I think what's so important and what I love so much about digital scholarship and these abilities to collaborate is that we get to model behaviors and engagement for our students. We get to model for them. If they're a librarian, they don't need to just go to a library conference and talk to librarians about this stuff. They can go talk to a historian. They can go talk to a chemistry professor. You know, we can start seeing these different connections that we wouldn't if we just stay within our little silos and that we're modeling that to our students, that we're modeling that if suddenly, you know, I can't get on the internet to show you something, I'm not going to freak out, I'm just going to go with it because it's an experiment and we're all in this together. And so then when they're presenting and something happens, they don't think it's the end of the world and they're going to flunk, they can say, okay, that didn't work, where's my plan B backup that I'm going to do next? So I think that's really, really key. Um, I want to close with thanks to my collaborators because obviously um, I'm not the royal we, so I can't collaborate with myself. So from biology, we have Erica Wilde and Karen Inouye. Um, Sarah Nielsen from the English department and Aline Sewells is my collaborator from the library and then Dr. Linda Ivey from history. I wouldn't be a good librarian if I didn't also give you my image credits, all of which uh, have licenses that allowed me to use them today and be videotaped. Um, and finally, I would just like to thank you so much for coming to this session, sitting through, not falling asleep. And I hope I've inspired you to go home and uh, do collaborations. I've heard we're going to do questions at the end, so thank you so much.